Tonight's presentation, the 1X, a new kit from Sonics Aircraft. Our presenter tonight is Jeremy Monet of Sonics Aircraft. Jeremy uh, is the CEO of Sonics Aircraft. He's an aeronautical engineer, a private pilot, a lifetime EA member, and a member of our local chapter as well, Chapter 252. Uh, and I consider him a good friend of mine, and uh, I think he'll do an excellent job with this presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jeremy and welcome him aboard. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, it's great to be here again uh, on a webinar series with you. And thank you for everybody for taking the time to uh, tune in. I, I think you'll find there's some really exciting information in this presentation that, that really has never been made public before. So looking forward to diving in here. And Jeremy, um, you sound great. And I just want to let everybody know we're over 450 people on tonight. I know a lot of times people want to know how many people are tuned in. It's fantastic and obviously really exciting, and uh, I think you'll find I'm about as enthusiastic about the One X as I am about anything, and uh, people consider me a pretty enthusiastic person. So uh, let me start tonight just with uh, a brief introduction. This is just a picture right after the first flight, which just happened last week, and uh, we're calling it the newest member of our thorough, thoroughbred uh, sport pilot aircraft family. Uh, we're very proud uh, of what our product line has accomplished and I'm very proud of the many people uh, who have contributed to making the One X a success. The obvious one is the one shaking my hand in that picture, and that's my father. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of him uh, in, 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 in mentoring me through this project. Another very important figure is Pete Buck, uh, Chief Design Engineer at Lockheed Martin. He's been uh, my primary engineering uh, mentor, just as my father's been my primary design mentor. And everything you see from me uh, has both their influences heavy. I'd also like to really thank the Sonic staff and uh, all the individuals who've uh, volunteered and uh, through their paid efforts have supported this program. It's really awesome, awesome group, awesome team we've got. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start now with uh, the, the presentation here. <laughs> Very first off, how do you keep up with the latest 1X news? We get this question all the time. My recommendation is if you haven't already done so, to join the opt-in mailing list. This is kind of a new technology where you log in. There's the link at the bottom of the page, the sonicsaircraft.com, RSS, info, HTML, one of the main links on our website. You're going to be one of, if not the very first person, to hear about new releases if you subscribe to those e, uh, opt-in e, uh, email lists because you're going to get it first. So uh, when we do announce kits or have other information, that's where it's going to be first. Also talk a little bit about the Hornet's Nest R&D development area. This is something my father founded a few years ago. It's really been in existence for, for many, many years, but we just officially titled it. It's where we're doing all our fun research and development stuff under that banner as kind of a separate entity from Sonics Aircraft. The goals of this program, the Hornet's Nest, are very simple. We want to provide new, exciting products to sport aviation. We want to maintain the core Le uh, industry leading values of affordability, simplicity, versatility, performance, quality, engineering, ease of maintenance. And we don't want to compete with current products or confuse the market with uh, similar products to what we already have. I'm going to move kind of quickly through these first slides because a lot of them will be review for those of you that have followed the Sonics so I can really spend some quality time in the meat of the presentation uh, in the middle and toward the end and, and have time for questions. But uh, this is really, this picture represents the bread and butter of Sonics Aircraft LLC. This is a Sonics kit. It looks like you just took a Sonics and you dumped it in an acid bath and it just fell apart on the floor in front of you. And that's really what the modern kits have turned into. In fact, the, the current price of this uh, entire, everything you see in this picture is about $15,000, which I think is pretty remarkable that we can deliver all these things. Laser cut skins, all the welding, the uh, plastic fuel tank, the uh, cowling, wheel pants, uh, all the formed ribs, uh, rivets, everything. So it's a very, in, in our opinion, one of the fastest build kits out there because of our core philosophy of uh, keeping things simple and having very detailed prints. Um, our other core uh, product, I'm trying to move through the slides here, is the Aero V engine. Um, this is uh, the, the 2.1 engine, it's evolved over time in the left-hand side there you see with the picture of the engine. Again, same thing, looks like it just kind of fell apart on the floor in front of us here. That's the way we sell it in a kit form uh, for about $7,000. Uh, 
And what's beautiful about these racing core VW uh, engines is their uh, amazing overhaul cost, 50 to 250 bucks, can replace components a whole head for two to three hundred dollars. I'd invite you to take a look at the webinar my father put on just on the engine. It's a very impressive little engine, and it's represented a, a, an ever increasing percentage of our overall sales as people use them on other airframes. Um, I also want to do a shameless plug for our workshop series. For those of you getting closer to your 1x decision, there's no better way to really make the final decision, in my opinion, than come to the factory, uh, see the parts, see, the, see it fly, meet the staff, uh, talk to me personally. Um, Two-day workshop here at the factory in Oshkosh. We do them in February, uh, usually first weekend in May and first weekend in October. So we actually have one coming up this weekend, so it's not too late to sign up. We've got a really solid group coming, despite it being uh, the middle of winter here. Um, really briefly, going over some of these uh, early airplanes. This is my father, who flew the, the first Sonics prototype with Pete. In, uh, this, is, this picture was taken in 1998, when I came back to kind of run the business and, uh, and learn from my father and Pete is in, in going through the business. It's a beautiful little airplane, two place, side by side, sports car of the air. This is a true, it, it, its heart is in recreational flying, but what we've noticed is there's a lot of versatility here. You got about 16 gallons of gas with the, an engine that, that burns about four gallons an hour, so you got good range, uh, loops, rolls, spins, so recreational aerobatics. Uh, you know, you could go on YouTube and, and watch some of the amazing videos some of our builders have put together and the kind of fun you can have in this airplane. That led, of course, to a tricycle gear version. Most pilots are tri-gear pilots, therefore, we, we wanted to offer a tricycle gear. That's just smart business sense, and, uh, and there's a lot of tricycle gears out there. They fly great. Um, the Aero B Sonics, that's my father and I over Lakeland, about 2000. This is when we first flew with the Jabru engines and the Sonics because they were available. We could bolt them on and go. And while we developed the Aero-V engine and then uh, worked it into the Sonics product line. And now that's the perfect marriage, the Aero-V with the Sonics. Uh, yep, we've done float plane. Uh, this is one of my one of the ideas my father had one day. He just said, you know, they got these cool floats we can put on. And yeah, we've done that. It's fun. Uh, the YX and the Xenos, uh, these three airplanes, it's my mom and dad, Betty and John, um, in front of the Sonics facility. Um, YX and two Xenos, all three of these airplanes flew on the same day. Uh, the, the YX is basically a V-tailed Sonics or Y-tailed Sonics, and the Xenos is a completely different animal uh, for soaring. That's me flying the YX in one of the early versions. Um, Aero V engine, of course. Um, and uh, just flies like a Sonics all the way around. Uh, a properly designed V-tail or Y-tail airplane will have the same flight characteristics uh, as a straight-tailed, again, uh, with people that, that know what they're doing and, and have the experience to make it happen. Um, the Xenos, this is uh, one of my favorite airplanes. Uh, it's, it's just a really elegant, nice, fun flying machine, extremely versatile, goes 100 miles an hour with the Aero-V. You can shut the motor down and soar at 40. Um, very comfortably, and uh, it's, it's, it, we feel this, this uh, airplane still has the potential to open up soaring to a whole new generation of pilots, and uh, we've seen an, an early dedicated group that have been out there flying the Xenoses, and we, we know that's going to grow as time goes by, but you could tell the brake in the fuselage forward is the same as a Sonics. Uh, it's got about a foot and a half longer, about 20% more tail, and, and obviously a lot bigger wing. And here's Dad flying it over Oshkosh. You can see the EAA uh, Eagle Hanger over the right-hand side, just over the logo. And uh, this is the kind of fun you can have. The prop, prop is stopped, basically, in the pattern. <laughs> and it's fun to see people's faces when you do touch and goes after landing with the props. Stop. We also, as, as the market expanded for the Sonic, started adding things. This is a sport trainer Sonic, so all the controls are in the center which would be perfect for you 1X pilots who are looking to get some uh, flight time uh, before you go and jump in your 1X and fly it. This is going to be your airplane. You're going to want to get some transition training in, in this airplane that handles almost exactly the same. Uh, so sport, sport trainer. Uh, and here's the sport acro. Uh, we, we decided to add a little more aileron and, and cut the flap down a little bit and, and see what this thing can really do with aerobatics. Our whole product line is fully aerobatic, and that's a tradition we continue with the 1X. So the Sonics is clearly the affordable kit aircraft. I don't think there's anything uh, on the market today that delivers as much for as little. 
uh, and, and we have our little reality checklist. You don't have to compromise anything to do it. And along comes the 1X, and that's why you're all tuned in tonight to hear the latest and greatest about the 1X. I, I'm calling it the more affordable kit aircraft. So everything we looked at when we sat down as a design team and group and talked about um, what are some of the ways we can actually cut the cost of aviation, uh, the 1X hits on just about every single one of them. Um, but here it is with the wings folded. It's just, just over 8 feet wide, just under 7 feet tall. And here I am in the first flight doing a low approach, which showed the kind of confidence I had in the airplane right away. Um, just an idea of costs. I know this is going to come up, and we'll review this slide at the end, because that's a common question we're going to get. But if you want to build a Sonics with an Aero-V, this is how much money you need in the bank, about $26,000. So it's 14 for the kit, some hardware, the Aero-V engine, the options. This is a little older pricing. It, the things went up just a little bit this year. But uh, instrumentation, two grand for instruments, a propeller, and upholstery. So that's a very basic rundown of what kind of costs you're looking at for a Sonics. And we know the 1X is going to be less than that. So here it is. Here's the one export aircraft. You can see it's got the, the tail drag on the top and the tri gear on the bottom in the three view uh, with the little exposed rocker covers and some of the basic specs. Why would Sonic's aircraft look at a single place airplane? Why would Jeremy want to design one? 90% um, of the sport flying is solo. That's just a fact and maybe even more. Uh, I know personally uh, that's most of the flying I do, especially with the test flying that I've done in our product line. Um, fewer parts. So the fewer parts that you have in a kit, uh, obviously, the lower the, the kit is going to cost us. Lower construction time, again, with fewer parts and the same plans, we can cut construction time. You're just not putting as many rivets in. You're not drilling as many holes. Um, better performance for less money. Uh, if you're looking for 3,300 Jabiru Sonics kind of performance on a budget, here's your answer. Go with the 1X. And smaller means it's easier to store. Obviously, this picture at the top of the page shows uh, you can fit it in a single car garage. Um, fold the wings by yourself. I'll go through that here a little bit later in the presentation. And a lot of you probably have already seen that demonstrated. The wing folding is the real key of the design. And in my opinion, it maximizes the value. Um, fold wings by yourself without tools. It's easy to transport and trailer. You can store it at home or share a hanger with two or more. And here are some of the modified specs. And, the, and I highlighted a couple at the bottom um, because that's what really blows the competition, any competition or any uh, single place Volkswagen aircraft that's ever come before this one. Uh, this one enjoys a sizable advantage and just blows them out of the water. Um, the VNE, the design VNE is 216 miles an hour. That is cruising, guys, really having some fun. And the design limits, uh, what we started with on the blank sheet of paper was plus, plus six minus three Gs. Uh, at 850 pound gross. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Now even with a little increased gross rate at 900 pounds, be very comfortable for some of you larger guys, which I know are inevitably going to want to build and fly this, uh, you're going to have a lot of safe fun uh, with the Aero-V engine. Um, one X single place, this is the, 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 the garage. We know not only would you maybe want a T-hanger to share with friends, but also uh, a standard garage. This is a 1 18th scale Volkswagen bus next to a 1 18th scale uh, 1X, uh, the tri-gear version. You can see it sits just under 7 feet tall, about 16 feet long. So very comfortably in your standard single car garage. And these, these slides have now become fairly famous. Um, this is really fun. Uh, you got, so if you have a Cessna 172 and a small T-hanger, you can fit one or even two 1Xs in there with it. And, and I believe, my prediction is, a lot, of, a lot of people that end up owning a 1X and operating a 1X uh, will be those that want to go out and do some recreational flying. So kind of have their Porsche Boxster um, in the garage along right next to their Dodge Caravan, two different missions. And then on the right-hand side, you can see you really cut the cost of aviation if you can get five 1Xs in one uh, T-hanger. It's pretty exciting. Um, 1X is sport pilot compliant, just like the rest of the Sonics aircraft family. The reason I stress that so much is there continues to be confusion about the compliance of and what a sport pilot can actually fly. Um, the maximum gross weight is 1,320 pounds. Obviously, with the 1X, we're well under that uh, at 900 pounds total. Uh, 1,430 for seaplanes. Uh, yeah, we could put some floats on the 1X and obviously still be under that. 
one or two occupants, the maximum clean stall of 45 knots or 51 miles an hour. The 1X is going to stall about 45 miles an hour, so you're well in there. Maximum straight and level airspeed at sea level at maximum continuous power 138. An Aero V powered uh, 1X will go about 135 miles an hour under those conditions, so that's sweet. Uh, fixed landing gear, single engine, and fixed or ground adjustable uh, propellers. So we're good to go. Sport pilots, you have your plane or product line. Um, let's get to the meat of the presentation. Going through some of the design features that we've refined since maybe you've seen it at AirVenture. Um, first on the engine installation, uh, you can see something very familiar to those of you that have built an Aero V or seen an Aero V in a Sonics, this fence baffle system which has been expanded to fit the 1X cowling, uh, already have the CAD work done there. Uh, we added an oil cooler on the top with a custom bypass plate and the idea there was uh, again saving some parts and saving some complexity, you just bolt an oil cooler right to the top of the motor. Uh, a split cowling, a top to bottom, uh, I heard some guys speculating that well why didn't you do that on the Sonics? Well to me the, the split line of the cowling is uh, kind of like uh, the same the same decision as some guys like Fords and some guys like Chevys. Uh, it's horses for courses. There's certainly advantages and disadvantages to both, but we liked going with the split cowl because the the one X has is a box at the front. It's basically a straight square or straight rectangle. So you can basically have a flat side, a flat bottom, and a flat side on the cowling and keep it retained and then just put the top on and screw it in place and have full engine access which is very nice as well. So that's integrated into the One X. Um, the Aero V 2.1 is obviously a perfect fit uh, for the One X. Uh, that's what this cowling uh, has been optimized for again with the exposed rocker cover which I think is pretty cool looking. Um, we can do some fun things with that in, in design and in paint to, to kind of fare it in and make it look even, even sexier. So that's that. Um, the fuel fill, let's talk about that. Um, we ended up with this 1X going a little simpler on our fuel tank because everything again is straight and we wanted to eliminate parts. We ended up just bringing the filler neck for our very famous and in my opinion the safest fuel tank in aviation period. Uh, this fuselage mounted uh, rotationally molded fuel tank. We ended up just bringing the filler neck straight up and just putting a plate with a little uh, um, uh, screw, a single machine screw in the middle of it that retains it. This little beauty bump will go because we're actually lowering uh, the cap uh, on the tank design itself. So you'll just have to remove one screw. But just be careful filling your fuel tank. I've, I've got many, many uh, fuel fills under my belt with the Sonics being next to the windshield. And as long as you just take care, take your time, and not drip and, and uh, get fuel all over everything, it works out perfectly. I also heard a concern about getting into the cockpit. That, that's, that's a joke. Uh, you just take your time filling your fuel and you won't, you won't spill a drop. 15-gallon um, fuel tank, by the way. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the design uh, on the windshield, exactly the same as the Sonics. It's just a flat wrap, which is super simple. And this is actually Lexan. And what we love about Lexan for windshields is if you do have any kind of bird strike or you do have some debris or something that gets kicked into you, it's not going to destroy your canopy uh, and crack it. It's a very, very tough material that, uh, again, isn't going to see a lot of fingerprints on it. Um, the canopy, I love the uh, hinged canopy on one side. It's as simple a canopy frame as you can get. Uh, it absolutely feels like you're a fighter pilot. If you go take a look at some of the new uh, example, the new Joint Strike Fighter has exactly the same looking canopy hinged on one side. Um, with these uh, hooks on it, for those Sonics guys out there, they're going to look very familiar. Uh, an extremely positive retention, a positive way to, to bring the canopy down and latch it in place, especially at the speeds that we're going to be going. So I think that's, that's an awesome, uh, simple design element. Uh, let's talk about the cockpit. Spend a little time here because that's what everybody uh, I think is, is going to have the most questions about when they go to put it on. Um, let's uh, On the left hand side again are all your controls. Uh, the, the very first sketch of the Sonics had all the controls on the left hand side. All your switches uh, on the left side of the panel. Our main uh, instrument, our radio, a little G meter for fun. And then on the right-hand side, we've got our little fuse box. And then right in the middle, you have a center-mounted control stick. 
that actually pivots forward of the spar, so uh, clears you uh, in every in every uh, plane. And then forward, we have the, the rudder pedals, and there's the very bottom of the fuel tank, the fuel sump. Uh, very simple upholstery, just a back and a, and a cushion with enough clearance for, for the stick. Uh, now looking some close-up views of what the cockpit looks like. On the left-hand side, your left hand is only ever on one of any of these controls, and we'll go through them one by one. Um, the red handle is the brake uh, in, in maintaining the Sonic's philosophy of simplicity and using the brakes for what they only for what they should be used for, which is to stop. Uh, you pull the brake handle, and uh, the airplane stops. It's a beautiful thing. Um, that's what the right handle is. Then just inside uh, Jeremy? Of that. Yes, go ahead, Charlie. Um, what happened to the, uh, I believe you had an, originally had a different uh, braking system, correct? Yep, that went away. I didn't okay. like it. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so, you know, the, a lot of things that we talk about here publicly are the things that work and the things that we end up um, settling on. Um, you know, a lot of things you're not going to see. So that's part of the process. So there's the red brake handle, and the, and the black is the flap handle. So here it's in the full upright position. There's a little notch in this angle. And then uh, this is the would be the uh, half flap position, about 22 degrees, and the full flap position of the 1X is actually 45 degrees. Here is the throttle quadrant. Uh, most people have these in their Sonics now. And one of Charlie's little inventions, putting your canopy latch right in the middle, canopy locking pin right in the middle of the throttle quadrant. Um, you have your mixture valve, which you're pretty much just going to use uh, to lean to optimize your fuel burn at altitude. And then this is our famous dial of speed trim system, which provides just the right amount of stick pressure. Uh, dial it forward to go a little faster, dial it back to go a little slower, and put back stick pressure on it. And then across the bottom, we have our switches, which are your standard switches, dual ignition switches, your starter switch, your master, your instrument, and your radio. And uh, that's uh, pretty much the control side. Um, now looking, this is basically if your belly button had a uh, camera, this is what it would look like um, looking right at the bottom of the panel here. Uh, you can see the main control stick with a push to talk switch right in the top. You can see the fuel tank here in the bottom. This is the same natural uh, rotational, natural color, so clear. So you can actually do a visual fuel check and see the, the fuel lines. And there's one gallon, two gallon, three gallons that I've gone ahead and marked on the side. And the rudder pedals, instead of the Sonics hinging from the top, these actually hinge from the bottom, and it's very comfortable. So um, one, uh, just a single, excuse me, just uh, the, the uh, rudder cable on the left-hand side with a link and the rudder cable on the right-hand side with a link with uh, two separate hinging rudder cables or rudder pedals. So pretty comfortable to sit in. Jeremy, There's the center of the yes. Go ahead. A couple of questions have come in about the width of the uh, width of the cockpit. How how wide is the cockpit? Twenty seven inches wide, and that's an outside dimension with a one inch Landron. But actually, with the one X, just like the Son X, you sit above the Landron line. Your shoulders do, so you actually have effectively twenty seven inches of clearance. Uh, I, I think we're going to be hard pressed to find anybody that doesn't fit in there. Um, so this is the center of the panel. We have our, our uh, Stratomaster uh, Extreme instrument, a little SD card. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, our microwave, our MGL radio, excuse me, MGL radio, and our MGL uh, G meter, which is actually there's a G meter in the in the extremes. You probably don't need that. And then uh, there's the number for the airplane, and of course just a little slip indicator, especially for early test flights. You want to see what's going on there. Um, let's talk about the flaps. You saw me, uh, I already talked about the 45 degree. That's what they look like. Uh, so for those of you that are used to looking at the Sonics uh, flaps, uh, these are uh, another position, another 15 degrees more. There's the full up position, the full down. Only on the inboard uh, wing section are the flaps. Um, the aileron and flap attachment, this is another important choice when uh, when we go fully aerobatic, uh, we want to make sure our ailerons are counterweighted. So on the bottom of each wing, we're actually looking up at the wing in this picture, but there's a little closeout for the counterweight that's extended out and actually comes down. So we want a nice clean installation there. And then here's a typical installation of the fairings we make and the very positive push rod attachment we have on our flaps, ailerons. Um, and elevator. So that's very typical of the of the Sonic's instruction and 
actually the 1x shares the same aileron and flap section, uh, excuse me, the at least the same aileron section as the uh, Xenos motor glider. So those were right off the shelf. Another design feature, and the one probably I'm most proud of in, in paying homage to the, my father who pioneered this gear in the first place, uh, invented it uh, with another friend of his, Mike Core, a gear with an integrated axle. This is a, an aluminum uh, landing gear, a single slab gear that's become a standard on a heck of a lot of home builds and even production aircraft. And the latest innovation in this is an actual integrated axle bolt. So you drill the hole through the aluminum gear and brought the axle through it. And I am just uh, extremely pleased with how the gear is handled so far. Um, being a, a less expensive option, you know, I love the titanium gear, let me be clear on that. But I found uh, flying with this aluminum gear, it's also um, been a joy. Absorbs, a, it, it covers up a lot of mistakes, let's put it that way, <laughs> especially end flares. Um, and there you see a little of the cover plate that also serves as the, uh, the, the, uh, the axle retaining plate that also serves to mount the wheel pants. So cut a lot of parts out of this part of the plate, part of the airplane. Um, the pedal static port is integrated right as far outboard as we could get it on the main straight section of the wing. So you basically bring your two um, uh, plastic tubes up to the instrument. So it's only about a, maybe a two foot or a three foot run uh, to get those, uh, those tubes run in the wing. Very simple to do. Now this is the real bread and butter, the, the real um, uh, key to the whole design and, and in my opinion what makes the 1X, uh, will make the 1X such a winner in the long term is this wing fold. Um, and and you, you'd be hard pressed to cut any parts out of this thing. Um, we basically have uh, one main steel fitting that it pivots on at the top here. And then on the bottom this is the uh, 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 pin retaining. Uh, when you bring this handle forward it brings a pin through the main spar and catches that main steel plate. At the same time, that same handle has this push rod which is running to the rear spar. I'll show a, a better detail of that in a minute. But so basically the one handle throttle one one handle motion, you're locking a pin in the bottom on the main spar and you're locking a pin on the rear spar. Extremely elegant and simple. And then uh, this part of the fold is actually the, the paddles which provide the aileron. So we have a push rod running from the uh, center of the airplane to this paddle. And then uh, they interface. This one has an adjuster arm on it and an adjuster arm up here on the outboard section. So those paddles interface together and pivot on this, uh, this little center machine fitting. And uh, we end up with, uh, with an aileron. Uh, there, there's a better, a little closer view of the aileron paddle. Again, this is running back to the cockpit with the push rod, and you can see the interface spot where that little same roller bearing is rubbing against the paddle. So it's pretty cool. Jeremy. And this is the procedure for pulling it. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Uh, Chris had asked earlier, could it be built without the folding mechanism? Yes, you could, but at this point, it wouldn't make any sense to me. Um, you'd be carrying a lot of extra parts, whereas if we just started with a blank sheet of paper and designed it. Uh, I'll make a prediction. The people that don't put the wing fold on a 1X are really going to regret it. Um, in my opinion, it's one of those features, um, like we found in a lot of things, uh, that you don't think you need until you have it and then suddenly you've got two or three hangar partners helping you with hangar rent and life is very rosy. A lot of gas money there, especially in this airplane. So in the wing fold pin handle, this is the procedure for, for moving the handle. Um, your left hand, uh, Dad's my hand model here, is grabbing this retaining pin and he's sliding the retaining pin out of the way of this main handle. Then with his right hand, he's grabbing onto the handle and he's pushing back, pushing back to lock it in place, or in this case, to unlock it, he's pulling it forward toward him. Very easy to do, just kneeling down, and you can see a video of that on our website. And then this is if you're doing a pre-flight inspection. If you do one thing, you're going to look at both wings from your comfortably seated position in the cockpit, and you're going to make sure that the picture uh, of what you see is this one on the left where the indicator is flush with the top of the wing. And if it's not, like it is on the right, your pins are not engaged and the wing will fold up. Luckily, it'll fold up uh, before you even get off the ground, so you'll know one way or another. 
Um, the one, it's another design feature that the Wingfold rear spar attached. This is what I was talking about earlier. There's a main pin, and you can see this is the blade is on the outboard section, and the fork is on the inboard section. It slides into position, and you and you automatically lock the tapered pin in place. Uh, another important, I think, pre-flight thing that you can visually check the rear spar pin attachment, uh, especially if the flap is down, you'll just be able to see it, which is great. The upward wing panel is removable, so if you did want to transport and you didn't want the wing you know, up top, it, it does not take very long to remove the main spar bolts and actually take the little wing panel off both sides. Another design feature is the tail, uh, basically a, a Sonics tail. It's an 85% scaled Sonics tail, um, but I think that the, the most innovating part of the 1X tail is that it shares the same tail tip between the horizontals and the verticals, so saved a part there. Also, it integrates the same uh, uh, rib into a single tip rib, so we only have three parts for the tip ribs and three parts for the for the glass uh, rib for the glass uh, tail tips, and we're done. Elevator looks very much like the Sonics. The tail is simpler than the Sonics, obviously, because you just have one fewer rib and a little different construction on the main spars. They cut a little cost out of it. And then the uh, another design feature, the tail spring tail wheel. I think. This is one of the most critically important design features of all tailwheel aircraft. Anybody that's ever flown a direct steering, uh, basically a straight pin connecting the rudder uh, horn here to the uh, tailwheel caster, uh, you, you'll wonder why you ever flew a, flew a free castering tailwheel. Uh, incredibly controllable, uh, simple transition. The minute the tail comes up, you're 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 flying with the rudder. So it's it's a beautiful thing, and and I think one of the strengths of our product line. Okay, I I anticipated there would be a lot of questions uh, centering on this. Will I fit? And my short answer is I'll be surprised if you don't. Um, the best way to find out is still going to be to come to the factory or to Air Venture and try it on. I mean, that's what we're here for, and I assume before you, you put money down, you're going to want to try it on. But here's an interesting example. You can see myself on the left-hand side. I'm 5'6", 150 pounds, um, and uh, I fit in just about anything. A coach class seat is a first class seat for me in, in flying commercial. And there's my father, almost exactly the same height. Um, and then behind us is uh, Scott Spangler, and some of you may recognize Scott's name. He was the editor-in-chief for, um, for EAA's publications for a number of years. Uh, he's 6'5". Uh, he came to our shop uh, last week to do a, uh, an article for Kit Planes magazine. Um, 255 pounds, 38 inch inseam, and he's got a size 15 shoe. And he fits. Um, one of the... Um, design changes we made since AirVenture was to actually make the pilot a little more in an upright seated position, which was great feedback we got from those that tried it on, as well as sliding the instrument panel forward. So you can see Scott's knees. He's in a kind of a bent uh, knee position, which is very comfortable, and his feet are on the rudder pedals and able to operate the rudder pedals, and he has full control of the control stick. And there's the canopy closed. You can see he's got maybe an inch or two uh, before he hits the top of his head, which is incredible. Um, it means that, that you guys uh, are going to fit in a 1X, and if you don't, I'll be fairly surprised. Um, so switching gears from there, I know I might have some additional questions, which I'll be ready to answer there. Um, the static load testing, this is something we take great pride in, and I spent a considerable amount of uh, design time and engineering time on setting up the static load test. Just wanted to show you just a, a little of the, of the many, many pages of documentation that exist in going through the different load cases and load case scenarios, setting up each of our wing positions, calculating the design loads for them, and then turning those into bags, and in this case, because it was readily available and inexpensive, I used uh, play sand, 50 pound uh, play sand bags. And we ended up loading the 1X tail. You can go to our website and again see this. But you're looking at 10,200 pounds loaded uh, onto, the, onto the 1X uh, wing. This is a center section fuselage with the wing in place. And yep, that's got the fold mechanism, just has uh, the pins in place on both sides. Um, Amazing, and again, the guys, uh, we figured our little team of seven guys lifted up over 100,000 pounds of sand as we loaded it and unloaded after each case. Um, the static uh, load test was also accomplished for the tail. 
Um, I think, again, this is one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, this airplane is hell for strong. And uh, there may be a guy that breaks a 1X, uh, but he's going to be doing something remarkably stupid. Um, so there it is. Uh, it gives you the same, same kind of design analysis, went into it, dividing it up into sections and figuring out what kind of bag loads we have at each section. And there's uh, Mark at JT who helped us out on the forklift lowering this with with all these these bags, these these uh, black plastic bags are 50 pounds each as well. Uh, we just had them spring leaks as we put them on, on up on their side. So 1,730 pounds, and we did not get any permanent deformation uh, in our tail. Uh, we have this this tail section, this horizontal stab on display now at our shop. Also, talk a little bit about switching gears now to weight and balance, because I know that's another common question we get. Um, as far as what, what type of pilot and how much weight we have uh, allotted for the weight and balance side. Here's a kind of analysis we go through with that, uh, with the pilot. Um, we actually calculate at all the arms uh, before we even built a single part, and we make uh, educated guesses on what our each component would weigh and where it would be located. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you see some of the analysis there, our empty weight of our prototype, 562 pounds. Uh, with an arm of 55.7 inches, which which results in about a 20% CG. Um, and then coming down the road, this is uh, Jeremy as a pilot, so I'm I'm putting 160 pounds. So maybe I had a, a big sandwich that day. I'm at 25 and a half percent, and then at the bottom, low fuel with me as a pilot, I'm, I'm at about 28 percent. So. Um, we're looking pretty good from a weight and balance perspective. I also ran some scenarios with some heavier guys up to a 250-pound pilot, and uh, still uh, within the CG range. Quite, quite pleased to see that. Flight handling. This is where I also want to spend a lot of time, and I know I'll get uh, some questions on this as well. Um, on the left-hand side is a picture taken, again, of that low approach on the first flight. And on the right-hand side is actually a really cool new feature that's available, and that is, um, uh, this is actual data, GPS cross-listed and performance data that was exported by our MGL uh, Extreme instrument. And uh, I think this is incredibly powerful for test pilots out there, for people like me who are real number crunchers and want to be able to tell people exactly what our product lines are doing. Um, there it is. This is our flight path. Uh, you can follow the yellow line on what I did for my second flight, and uh, you can see I'm, I'm staying close to the airport in every mode because that's what good test pilots do early on. And I basically climbed the altitude, and you can see the lines getting higher, and I, I ended up climbing to about 3,000 AGL and making four or five circuits, and then coming down and doing some pattern work, uh, tearing, tearing around the, na the neighborhood and testing the effectiveness of the flaps. So. Um, I, I did high speed. I saw speeds uh, approaching 170 miles an hour, a little over 170 miles an hour, which would be a 3300 uh, Jabiru powered Sonics, uh, exactly what I expected and made me very, very happy. And then slow speed took it down on the second flight down to just under 60 miles an hour, solid as a rock, uh, just like the Sonics and just like I expected. Um, so I wanted to run through a few uh, of what I anticipated would be the questions, and then we can kind of open it up to uh, any questions that, that the attendees have. But um, question number one is, how much is the 1X going to cost? And, and the short answer is, it's going to be less than the Sonics. Um, the, the Sonics, as I said before, let's give it a round number, say $15,000 for the full kit. Obviously, we're business people, and we know that the, the less expensive uh, we can make it, the more we're going to sell. So we're committed, and by the way, as another caveat, the more popular the One X is, the less expensive it's going to be for everybody because we can uh, beat up some of our suppliers on, on uh, quantity discounting, which is great. Um, when will the kits be available? As soon as we complete the flight testing. That's a, our most important one. Uh, get the plans completed, which I've been working on all along. Um, of course, we want to finalize the pricing and get all the components in stock before before we offer it for sale. But I expect it to be uh, very soon, as soon as we can possibly do it. Uh, are you going to offer subkits like you do with the Sonics? And the answer is yes. We we do plan to offer subkits, but I got to tell you, I, I really encourage uh, those who are looking to maximize every dollar to go the full kit route. Um, 
as I look at things, especially with the 1X and how simple the tail is, how simple the fuselage is, uh, especially with some of the new um, integration of uh, laser cut and form channels and parts, uh, this thing's going to go together in a huge hurry. So uh, you're going to be finishing your tail and wondering why you just didn't go ahead and order the whole kit and save a few thousand dollars. Um, tough to beat it. Alternative engines like the 3300 Jabru, I saw this pop up on our list. And my answer is it re really doesn't make sense to me uh, to put a 3300 Jabru in a 1X. And, and the bottom line is, and the reasons are, we've got an optimized installation for the Aero V engine. Um, the cowling, the motor mount, the spinner, these are components that took a long time to, to manufacture and prepare for a kit. And uh, it's only one part that we have to stock for the kit, which, which simplifies things greatly. Um, we're maximizing our sport pilot and aerobatic performance on an Aero V. Um, since we control the engine, um, we control the pricing, and uh, we're able to offer it. Uh, the Aero V, there's number three, leads right into it, 69.95 for the whole Aero V engine, and the Jabru 3300 is currently 18.5. Um, you know, in our experience, as far as performance goes, because I know this is going to come up, and I'll be happy to address it on the email list publicly and, and in my future uh, presentations on the subject, but you know, there's, seem, there's this prevalent attitude that it's just never enough. You know, is 200 miles an hour fast enough? Is is 250? Uh, is 300 miles an hour fast enough? Not for some guys, uh, but for me, you know, 170 mile an hour airplane, that is going, man. That is rocking and rolling and, uh, on, on, on a budget. Um, did I hear the 1X fuselage was stretched compared to the prototype that I may have tried on or seen at the Air, at, uh, Air Adventure? It was an option we looked at, and I did publicly talk about it, but we didn't end up doing it. Uh, the fuselage is exactly the same length as what we displayed at the, at the air show. We ended up, again, changing the seating position to make people uh, a little more upright, which is both more comfortable, uh, provides more leg room, provides uh, more lee knee room, and uh, puts the onus on us to, to get the canopy shape right so you make sure you have enough headroom. And, uh, that's that. I think we kind of covered all the bases, and it was great to be able to uh, to have people try out an AirVenture. Uh, question six, what's the build time? Well, obviously less than the Sonics. Um, if I had to give you a percentage less than the Sonics, I'd say maybe 25 to 30 percent less than the Sonics with the integrated features and lower part count and all that. But it's still going to take some time, um, you know, and, and build time is our most common question, and it's the hardest one to answer because it varies so much. Uh, some experienced builders are going to put uh, these 1Xs together in 300 hours, and some uh, are going to drink a lot of coffee and, and gab a lot with their friends and spend a lot of time uh, scratching their head, and they're going to take 1,000 hours or more. Uh, that's going to be the exception, in my opinion, not the rule. The guys that really, even inexperienced builders, are going to be able to rock and roll on this 1X. Um, and all you really need to do, in my opinion, is just look at it. The construction is extremely simple. And will there be a tri-gear version? You bet there will be. I know, again, there's a lot of pilots out there training in tricycle gear aircraft, and uh, it's just a logical thing to offer from a product perspective. And I fly the heck out of our tri-gear Sonics, and I absolutely love it. I've tested probably seven new products with that airplane, and I'm extremely comfortable with it. Um, ways to follow the Sonics. This is, again, wanted to spend a little time on this. Uh, Stay in touch with the Hornet's Nest R&D website. Uh, join the opt-in mailing list. Uh, that's probably the best one for those of you that are looking to put a deposit in or be one of the first ones on the list. Join that opt-in mailing list. You will hear about it uh, or be one of the very first to know. Uh, join the Sonics Talk email list. I'm on there quite a bit. Uh, we as a company make postings periodically, especially when we see the, the conversation get completely off topic and, and irrelevant. Um, come to a Sonics workshop. February, May, October. Again, we have one this next weekend, so if you're, if you're ready to, to make a commitment, come on out. We are going to honor a, uh, a kit discount for those that come to the workshop. Uh, or come to Oshkosh Air Venture, our home air show, uh, July 25th through 31st. Uh, we absolutely love the show, and we spend a lot in terms of time and money and resources to support it and encourage all you Sonics guys out there to br bring your airplane and maybe consider the 1X as, you, as, your, next, uh, as your next project. 
So that uh, pretty much wraps up the program portion here. There, there's obviously much more to come. Uh, I'm really excited about this airplane, and I'm really excited about some of the deriv derivatives that are yet to come. But uh, this, this covers a huge market segment and, and to me makes for just, just a, a perfect airplane for what we set out uh, to accomplish. And I'll, I'll just kind of leave the total cost worksheet up for those of you that, again, wanted to consider the costs involved since uh, we are, in fact, running a company. And uh, that's, that's how we make our living. So, Charlie, do you see any questions that are up on the screen? Um, Jeremy, I have a lot of questions here, some of which you have covered, so I, I may be repeating a, a couple of things. Um, but let's go ahead with the airfoil. Is it the same airfoil as on a standard Sonics? Mm -hmm. it, it is. It's a 64415 airfoil. Um, and, and, and to be honest, guys, this is what, what's so awesome, in my opinion, especially when we talk about flight handling. I, I, was, I was extremely calm during the first flight, uh, not nervous at all. And the reason for that is, number one, when I first sketched out the three view of the 1X, I took an 85% scale Sonics. Those of you that heard me speak about this before have, have heard it before. But an 85% Sonics, that means about the same amount of tail area, actually just a little bit more uh, of horizontal stab, because if I've ever heard one criticism of the Sonics, and you really gotta, you really gotta dig to find a criticism of the Sonics flight handling, um, it was that it's it's uh, uh, either on the neutral side of stable or even negative uh, in pitch stability, which means it handles like a fighter, which is why we designed the thing the way we did. But let's set that aside. Uh, we knew the one X, uh, you know, we might want to add a little more horizontal, so that's what we did. Um, so I knew it'd be a little more pitch stable than the Sonic, so it was basically hands-off flying airplane on the very first flight. Um, on uh, the airfoil, to answer your question directly, uh, 64415, uh, with just a little less span, so I knew it would have the same uh, awesome slow speed handling characteristics that the Sonics does, and it does. Okay. Uh, let's say you have a Jabru 2200 sitting in your basement, and you want to install it on a 1X. Is the Jabru 2200 going to be supported? It's very doable, and, and let me back up because I did I did kind of basically say it just doesn't make sense to do alternative engines, 22, 30, 300 Jabru, but of course it can be done. Of course it can, and the only question that we have to look at as a company is uh, are we going to support it with a motor mount and a cowling and, and, and a spinner or any other uh, uh, attributes that need that are needed. Uh, in my opinion, no. Um, I'm, I'm leaning toward just making this an AeroV only airplane because that's what makes sense. Now, that just means you'll get an AeroV mount and an AeroV cowling, uh, and it'll be up to you to make the modifications, which, by the way, for a 2200 Jabru will not be very extensive uh, in order to, to put it in a 1X. Uh, but to me, it, it just doesn't make sense. The AeroV is the ultimate fit for this airplane, and that's what I'm committed to supporting in the short term. Okay, Mike would like to know if he'll ever offer a plans built option for this aircraft. Uh, not, no. Uh, I, I never say never because I've been in this business too long to say never. But um, no, uh, in my opinion, uh, we love plans builders. Obviously, that's what I did. I built from a set of plans and sketches and drawings to build the One X for the first time. But when the rubber meets the road uh, and you do end up making this industry your livelihood. Uh, we have to make certain decisions and certain sacrifices. And, and one of the decisions is to just offer this a, as a complete kit. On, on another interesting side note that a lot of people don't think about when they, when they expect us to do uh, plans building is, number one, the costs, when you really get down to it, are really not that much for a kit-built airplane, especially if we're able to do a 1x in volume, the overall cost. Um, and, and obviously the time savings is considerable. Um, but they also don't think about the plans and the engineering time that goes into the plans. Um, we kind of revolutionized the plans industry by when Pete and Dad uh, offered the set of plans for the Sonics. It, it was and continues to be the best in the business. Absolutely everything you need is on that plan set. 
and there were thousands and thousands of hours put in on those plans. With the 1X plans, we'll be able to offer this a lot more quickly because a lot of those details that were spent, you know, many of those thousands of hours were spent sketching dimensions and details from parts that were already made. And now we'll be able to just show them on a plan sheet with a part number and install this here, uh, especially with laser cut parts and uh, pre-assembled welded components and those kinds of things. So it's a considerable simpler project uh, using a complete kit. In my opinion, it's not that much more expensive a project, especially with a simple airplane like the 1X. And uh, it makes just really good business sense. Uh, so we're able to continue to offer the best support in the industry, period. OK, uh, Pete asked, why 6061 instead of 2024? Yep, that's a very common question. Um, aluminum, the that 60, is. 60, yeah, 6061 T6 aluminum that we use in uh, all the primary structure and what you see here, uh, me flying on the left here. Um, it's, it's half the price, roughly, of a 2024 uh, quote-unquote aircraft aluminum. Um, it's not that much less strong. And you actually, you've seen since, since my father and Pete selected 6061 for the Sonics back in 98, you saw a lot of newer airplanes uh, going with that alloy. Uh, for years, the Zen Air series have used it in much smaller, thinner uh, um, skin sections. The bottom line is 6061 is, uh, by the time you factor in the Alclad, you do, you do and it does not have an Alclad, by the way, the, the Alclad that's on the 2024 is pure aluminum layer on the top and bottom. Um, by the time you factor that in, you don't have to use that much more, but you do. You have to use just a little bit more uh, uh, aluminum, so it's a little bit heavier. But the trade-off is you get a much lower cost, which is great. And by the way, as an extra special bonus, with 6061, you get better corrosion resistance uh, because it is more pure aluminum than a 2024 alloy. When you drill the hole, you immediately get the oxide layer that forms and protects it which is why we're so comfortable using stainless steel rivets with the 6061 uh, T6. Um, Alan uh, asks, why do you feel that your tank, uh, your fuel tank is so safe? You mentioned that earlier. Sure. I'll talk about it. Here it is in three view in section. Um, there is no better fuel tank to protect from spillage than a rotationally molded plastic tank. Um, in my opinion, there is no safer place for the fuel than where we put it, which is in the fuselage. In, in accidents and incidents, which there have been a few for the Sonics, despite its great handling qualities, uh, uh, people still do dumb things, what can I say, um, or have an unfortunate circumstance uh, where they'll end up uh, uh, getting in an accident. But um, in any event, when you do have an impact, uh, it means that, that you won't have any fuel drip or spill out uh, and get ignited. And in fact, there's been a couple people, again, that have tested that. Um, also, uh, with uh, wing tanks, which would be another option, um, you actually end up having the, t having the fuel lower. And by the way, wings get ripped off in a lot of accidents. So I don't accept any uh, argument that it's safer in the wings away from you. That's, that's just not true. Um, but anyway, Back back to the to the tank. If it, if it were to burst and, and catch fire, that's in my opinion where the problem is. If you go to a low wing airplane and you put fuel in a in the wing tanks of a low wing airplane, you now need a fuel pump, a pressure regulator, a lot of things we don't like. With this system, we're able to maintain gravity feed, uh, which eliminates another failure mode, uh, which would cause an accident in the first place. Uh, so just go gravity feed. It's fantastic. Okay, uh, several questions about baggage and how much space is available and what would the limitation be? On the baggage, yeah, we do, and you can see it here. It's calculated in just five pounds is what I had on the, on the weight and balance. But the, the place for the baggage would be just behind the pilot in this area. So where I, you actually have, we actually have a little dimension running to it. Um, we have a baggage bag that's going to work just like the Sonics. And, and you'll be able to put up to 50 pounds of baggage. Um, if anything, with a little airplane like the 1X, you're going to have to watch your CG. Um, so I, I don't believe it'll be a function of uh, you know putting too much weight in there. A baggage bag will hold 60 or 70 pounds. 
but you really, as a pilot, have to be aware that it's in the aft CG location. So you, you start piling too much back there, and, and you don't want to get in that situation. So be very intimately familiar with your 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 particular airplane's weight and balance, and you should be fine. You know, it's it's again a uh, like a Porsche Boxster. How big is your uh, how big is your trunk? Not very big. Probably about the same size as it is in the One X for the baggage area. So. Um, you know, that's the philosophy. It's just going to be something you take up on a day trip uh, or a couple day trip. Okay, Walter had asked, um, do you have to buy the engine? <clears throat> do you have to buy the engine with the kit, or, or can you use your own engine? You've been showing it yeah. with the engine priced in there. Sure, absolutely not. You you will be able just like you do for the Sonics, and that goes to the answer to the sub kit question. Um, You'll be able to, to purchase the sub kit separately. You'll be able to purchase the complete kit as a standalone purchase, uh, propeller, upholstery, instrumentation. That's all broken out separately. And I guess I did not address that either yet, Charlie. Um, we're not uh, dictating anything uh, to be used in this airplane. That's just not my style. But what I have found in, in working in this business and in running this business for the last dozen years um, is that I promise you as a builder, you are very well served to follow the recommendations of the factory. And by those, I mean a fixed pitch wood propeller that's optimized for the airplane. That's why I'm going through a thorough flight test program. Uh, the Aero-V will fit. It will work, and it's the best engine in the business, period. Um, it is fully supported, and if you follow the detailed instructions and maintenance, you're going to love it. Um, the instrumentation, you have a whole bunch of variety of options on instrumentation. I showed it, and in fact, my father has been fairly open about not being a, just excuse me just a minute, I'm going to scroll back through till you see the panel again. But my father is not a big fan of this little uh, Stratomaster Extreme, and I wish it was on. And the only reason he's not is all the numbers are kind of small. And you know, he uh, can't see like he used to be able to, and, and by the way, I'm getting there too. Um, but uh, I love it. It's very brightly colored. I can see everything. It logs all my data. I think it's phenomenal. What he would prefer is actually a large screen black and white instrument like you see over here. These are the little smart singles. And it's very conceivable instead of paying, you know, 12 or 1300 bucks for this extreme colored instrument, you can put, uh, you know, two of these little uh, black and white instruments in it. You don't have to spend the money on a panel mounted radio. You can just go with a handheld. Um, so a, a lot of options. There's obviously some great instruments by uh, companies like uh, Dynan or, or Grand Rapids EIS. A lot of good options, but these are the ones that we sell and support. Okay. Um, during your venture, you talked about uh, moving it from a tail dragger to a tri gear fairly easily. Is that still going to be the case? Absolutely, yes. Um, and I'm going to just again, excuse me while I fast forward here to my slide that shows that cutaway. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to recommend that, that you not uh, fire through all your slides uh, quite so much because I've, I've noticed your audio okay. quality started to degrade here, and I think that might be the cause. Okay. okay. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. I apologize. I'll uh, watch, I'll watch my little uh, voice speaker here. here. Um, on the, on the um, um, converting, converting from a tail, dragger, tail dragger to a tricycle, to a tricycle gear, gear, here is here what, what would be required. Um, um, you, would take, you would take your, your straight, straight aluminum, 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 aluminum gear, gear, which is positioned right, right about, right about where the guy's foot, guy's foot is, is just, just after, after that. that. You actually, you actually take that and turn it around. And uh, uh, position, position it to the next two lines, lines you see here, which is your ear uh, support by the tricycle gear, which are in, which every, in every one. one. And you and put you the put four four bolts in there, there, so about, about behind, behind the pilot pilot's knees, knees picture. picture. And then and you, then would, you install, would install, then you would you install, install the uh, forward, forward nose nose gear. gear. And uh, that, that actually, actually an add-on add on standard, standard uh, uh, motor, mount. motor mount. So be able so to be able to plug that, in, that in and, uh, and, uh, and, and inflate place. in place. Okay, Jeremy, we're still suffering through some poor audio quality uh, right now. Um, so I'm going to answer a question uh, from Greg. He says, is the 1X a good choice for a first-time kit builder? And uh, some, as somebody who has just uh, completed a Sonix, I, I, I have to say that for a, a first-time builder, I think it would be an excellent choice of a project. Uh, the plans are, are very complete. 
Uh, the kit is complete, excellent service from the factory. So uh, my personal opinion, it would be a great kit. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you chime in on that one, and we'll see how your audio is doing. And now I'm getting no audio from Jeremy. Uh, Charlie, I'm here. I apologize. Okay, I can hear you a little bit, but uh, the audio still seems to be very poor. Okay, okay. Okay, let's go to a, a question from John. Are you going to offer the completed spar and pre-cut angle options with the Sonics? Or, I'm sorry, with the uh, One X? Yeah, that, that would absolutely be the plan. And uh, before we make the final decision on that, we will actually want to uh, uh, go through the 51% uh, rule process that we'll plan on doing. Uh, and I, I'm 100% confident that it will be compliant. And, uh, we'll, yeah, that's the answer. Yes, we plan on offering those options. Okay, and the audio is coming back uh, a little bit. Uh, Jen would like to know, what kind of climb rate are you seeing on your first flight tests? Yep, uh, on the first flight, uh, very similar to uh, what our single plays are flying the Sonics uh, solo, if not a little bit better. Uh, so I saw climb rates upwards of uh, about 1,200 feet per minute. Uh, taking my climbs pretty easy, and uh, that's what I would expect is uh, most 1X guys will see about 1,000 feet a minute. Okay, and uh, Brand would like to have you talk a little bit about the uh, trailing of the trailering of the vehicle. Um, are you going to be able to do that on its own gear or on a, a trailer? What are you thinking at this point? Uh, yes, if you want to. Now, I would say my personal opinion is that if you are going to take it a short distance, so if we're just going to take it across town or, you know, under 50 miles, then, yeah, by all means, towing it on its own gear is an option. Uh, expect excessive tire wear because of uh, how much wear you're going to be putting and starting and stopping and turning. Um, if you're planning any kind of a sizable trip, then my strong uh, opinion and recommendation would be to get a flatbed trailer and roll the 1X with the wings folded up onto it uh, and, and then tow it that way. Uh, but yeah, it's most definitely designed to be able to just take the tail wheel and mount it up on a trailer hitch or a little pan on your trailer hitch and, and tie it down and uh, take it to the airport. It's going to be very doable. Okay, Mark would like you to uh, explain how the steerable um, uh, nose wheel works. Is it free castering? Is it steerable? How does, how does the nose wheel work? Exactly like the Sonics, uh, which would be uh, a, a direct steering link that goes from the rudder pedal through the firewall and ties into a little uh, steering arm on the top of the, of the, of the nose strut. So when you push left rudder, you get left input on your tri-gear. We've had tremendous success with this. And I would say, again, let's, let's group the free castering tricycle gear setup with the direct steering tailwheel setup. You aren't able to turn on a dime, but in exchange for that one small concession, uh, you have a phenomenal uh, handling aircraft in all modes. And uh, that's just something that's a core philosophy of ours and why the 1X was so uneventful, even on the first flight, with ice all over the runway. Okay, a lot of questions, Jeremy, about the turbo, where we are with it, and whether it will be an option for a 1X. Coming soon, a webinar devoted to the turbo. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Um, that, that is absolutely the plan, uh, joking aside, uh, to, to have something uh, um, dedicated to it. Um, er, early success, that's really all I have to say about that. Um, the, the turbo has been really good. There, there's, with all installations like this, I think guys are very excited, and I would be very excited, about um, the prospect of for a few hundred or even a couple thousand dollars to, to boost horsepower by a measurable amount, maybe 30 to 40 percent. Th that's really exciting to me. Um, 
in reality, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of, of tweaking that has to happen. There's a lot of flight testing that has to happen and, and in the R&D process. And I think everybody uh, uh, in the Sonics community knows uh, we're not the kind of people to uh, under uh, or over promise and under deliver. We're going to be quiet about it. We're going to go behind the scenes and do all of our test flying and all of our uh, performance measuring and then we're going to uh, come out publicly uh, with it. But uh, so far, so good is all I have to say for now. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the whole program and about being able to offer it as a, as a future product. Okay. Uh, Eric has a question related to the sport pilot aspects of the design. Do you have to derate the engine or, uh, you know, pick a prop that is uh, – uh, not that, uh, not much of a cruise prop to meet the sport pilot limits. Great question, common question, and the answer is no. Uh, we do not have to derate the engine. Uh, I will answer this one again. I want to group it with something else. An Aero V powered One X, from a sport pilot performance perspective, is almost exactly the same as a. 3300 Jabru powered Sonics. The reason, and let's be clear, both of those airplanes can go 170 miles an hour under the right conditions. Take it up to altitude, firewall it, go. Uh, in the sport pilot definition, it is maximum speed and level flight at sea level at maximum continuous power. The maximum continuous power on an Aero V is uh, 3,000 RPM. Uh, so if you run 3,000 RPM under those conditions, you're going to go 125 miles an hour. Um, so it, it's automatically sport pilot compliant with those performance specs. And if anybody ever gives you any static about it, you send them to me, and I will be happy to educate them. Um, because there just continues to be a lot of confusion about this despite all of our efforts and EAA's great efforts in educating people uh, and actually FAA people in, uh, directly on this rule. Um, but anyway, the important thing and, and where you're actually going to be hurt as a pilot uh, is not when you go super fast. It's when you're on approach to land and where I think our product line excels from most of our competition. Uh, is on its extremely low landing speed, where there just isn't a lot of energy for anything to happen. And that's what we've encouraged the FAA and the bureaucrats, not the FAA, but the lawyers and bureaucrats that ended up tacking that onto the sport pilot rule, which just makes no sense. Okay, several questions, uh, uh, but I'll just use Brian's question as a summary. It looks good with the canopy off. Can it be flown open cockpit? <laughs> Um, we get that question on the Sonics a lot, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's just not something I'd want to be the test pilot on because of the significant canopy size and the negative pressure area. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm confident you could fly it with the canopy off, but, I, again, it's just something that wouldn't make sense, any sense whatsoever to me. Um, fly this as an as a enclosed airplane and, and maximize your performance. That's what this is all about. Okay. Uh, when, are, when can we expect the uh, the one e or the <laughs> wine x <laughs> when, version when, of the one x with the when, v tail when, or the y tail? <laughs> when, 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 Charlie? When is it going to happen? Um, my father educated me very early on, uh, and hopefully, I have uh, taken his advice to heart during this presentation to um, never, ever promise a date for a delivery of, of, of something that you don't necessarily have refined and ready and on the shelf. Um, he's exactly right. Uh, I'm not going to speculate about what's next. I will tell you about what I'm going to be doing the next few months. And uh, really, anybody that, that has any knowledge about Sonics aircraft and what we do and how we do it knows this already. Um, I'm going to finish off the 1X. That means finishing the plans, the parts, fulfilling a, a commitment to myself and uh, to the community to come out with this awesome product um, at an affordable price that it really is, in my opinion, a, a, an evolution of the Sonics, but a revolution in the way uh, we can afford to fly. 
Um, I'm going to be supporting fully the eFlight project, which uh, again referenced the webinar on the eFlight. Um, we have a ton uh, of things going on with the electric project. Um, and uh, I continue to support those efforts with Pete and Andrew and my father. Um, I'm going to be running the day-to-day -day operations of Sonix, which is a considerable amount of time in keeping things moving. And uh, then in our spare time, we're going to fly some of the other products we have, the Turbo. Uh, we've been doing some things with the Sport Acro uh, and getting it ready for competition. We have another one on down the way. We just have a ton on our plate, guys. But uh, the sky is the limit. And all I'd ask is that if you're, uh, you want to support those efforts, the best way is to buy one of our products uh, and build it and, and have a heck of a lot of fun. OK, Martin noticed that the flaps look small. Are they effective? Yes. Uh, great, great observation. You're exactly right. And there was an open debate with the design team about just how effective those flaps are. Um, I did a very cursory evaluation with flaps, with and without, at altitude. And then when I did my pattern work, and I saw at 80 miles an hour on base leg with full flaps, I saw a descent rate of 1,200 feet a minute. And that's in some pretty cold air. That sounds pretty effective to me. So what makes it, and, and by the way, with the 45 degree flaps, even though they're very short uh, span flaps and short cord flaps, um, you got a nice pitch change. And all pilots know when you get a little pitch change where the nose comes over a little bit, your visibility increases and life is good. So um, I, I think it was the right decision. But uh, again, our performance uh, as we expand the envelope, we'll, we'll be able to tell you for sure what they do. But so far, so good. I, I think they're, they're very effective, again, being a 45-degree flap on the 64 airfoil. OK, uh, Will would like to know whether you need to build any fixtures for constructing the aircraft. Um, no, and, and that's a great uh, point. Um, one of the greatest assets of our product line is that you do not need uh, fuselage jig, wing jig, anything. You need two sawhorses and a flat table, and that's it. OK, and, uh, several, several questions about, you know, is it going to be pre-punched, or how, how much prefabrication can you expect with the kit? Yeah, I wish I would have stuck my uh, kit picture at the end of the presentation. Well, I guess I can try to pull it up here, and uh, maybe this won't affect my audio as much. Um, let's talk about it in terms of this picture. Um, the pre-punched aspects, uh, all of the wing skins you see, the wing skins, the fuselage skins, the tail skins, all pre-punched. And in the cases of the leading edges and the tail skins, pre-formed. Um, the channels, many of the 90-degree channels will now be pilot hold. So we will have our first matched hole technology kit with the 1X. Um, we will not have matched holes in the ribs, in the formers, in the curved sections. But uh, that's a whole no, no level of money and, uh, and time and investment. Um, not yet. But uh, a very advanced. I put it on par with anybody out there. And again, keep in mind, with a 1X, you're going to have roughly half the part count uh, of any competing aircraft. Uh, because it's so simple and because the fuselage is square and because our whole philosophy is about getting rid of parts wherever we can. So all that adds up uh, along with you know the best set of plans in the business uh, to making a pretty quick build, especially for those of you out there that have built other metal aircraft. You're, this thing's really going to go together fast for you. OK, we've had several um, builders attend or or people attend your workshop and they want to know whether there's a, a, a the discount that's typically offered if you come to the workshop applicable to the 1X or they have to re-attend the workshop? Nope. If you've already come to a workshop, then that discount will be made available. That's the promise I made um, publicly and privately to anybody that came. Uh, watch for details uh, when we make the kit pricing and kit announcement. Uh, in the fine print right below it will be the discount that applies to those that have come to the workshop. And you can expect something very similar to what we've done with the Sonics, Wyatts, and Xenos. And again, that's the promise I've made, and we'll fulfill that commitment. No need to, no need to attend again. You've already come once, and we appreciate that. 
Okay, several questions about the type of rivets, rivets you can expect to see in this kit and whether anyone has actually done an all flush or driven version of the uh, uh, of any of your designs. Sure, I'll answer the question in parts the way it was asked. Um, the rivets we use are the uh, stainless steel Avdel Cherry N rivets, which are uh, twice as strong in shear as a driven rivet. They're phenomenal in terms of uh, looking at it from an engineering perspective and a design perspective, and they're super easy to install. So they look great from a manufacturing perspective as well. I love them. Um, in terms of flush rivets, absolutely. You can dimple and uh, countersink to your heart's content, and you can, uh, you can go ahead and make the flush rivet 1x. And you know what? From 20 feet away, the guy standing next to you, if you have one that's flush riveted and one that's standard riveted, uh, he's not going to be able to tell the difference until you get right up to it. So I think it's a waste of time. Just Jeremy's opinion. Um, in terms of uh, the last of your questions, can you go ahead and solid rivet uh, the whole thing? Most of it, yes. As long as you can get in and get a bucking bar back there and, and get, get to hammer it, uh, yes, you could. Again, an uh, eighth inch rivet for eighth inch rivet because the, the, the pops are so much stronger uh, than, than the driven rivets in shear, which is how we use them. Um, so yeah, you can do it. Again, I think it's just a total waste of time. Uh, you, you, you cannot do uh, uh, solid riveting in enclosed structures. So in this picture, that would be the tail surfaces, at least one side, so you'd have to pop rivet the bottom of the tail. Uh, the uh, the flaps, the the uh, ailerons, that kind of stuff. Okay, several people asking what uh, what if any presence you'll have at uh, Sun and Fun this year. Yeah, uh, I will be there. My father will be there. Uh, you can go on our website right now and see the forum schedule, and I'll be kind of bringing an update to the One X. Uh, we haven't made any commitment beyond that. We're just going to be there for a couple of forums. Um, you know, the, the primary reason, which I'll be happy to tell you, is what I already mentioned. We have an absolute ton on our plate and things that we continue to want to make progress on. And we just have seen Sun and Fun dwindle a bit in, uh, in attendance and in, in making a, a standard commercial presence. Um, just not, just uh, a, a big commitment for not a lot of payoff. What I would highly recommend is that anyone out there looking to come to a fly-in, come to Oshkosh. Come to Air Venture. Uh, we have a huge presence. We have, uh, I think it's a, a, a ten, all ten of our factory prototype aircraft on the field, able to view them, sit in them, look at the differences, talk about the nuances. Come to the factory for a factory tour, see it. It's our home show, and uh, that's that's the show I would recommend everybody come to. Uh, again, if you do decide to come to Sun and Fun, make sure I believe our forums are on uh, um, Wednesday and Thursday. So make sure you check that schedule, and I believe it's subject to change. So make sure you check our website uh, for that before you make the commitment. Okay, Jeremy, several questions about this. Uh, when the wings are folded, is there any support for the rear of the wing or the wing tips? How exactly do you make sure that the, the wings are stable when they're in the folded position? Yeah, in the folded up position, we'll have both. Um, we already have on the design boards a little uh, locking uh, handle, if you will, a locking, it'll look like a blade on one end and a fork on the other. So you actually be able to lock the rear spar with that piece as a separate piece. And then we also have uh, a little latch mechanism that I drew up for the wing tips to be able to stabilize the tips. Uh, so those are in the works. Right now, they're not on the prototype. Neither of those have been integrated, but that is, that is absolutely the plan. And in my opinion, with the with the stoutness of the of the uh, main steel fitting on the spar, I'd be comfortable with you locking down the rear spar for your short trips. But if you're going to go on a long trip, I I'd probably consider removing the the outboard wing panels uh, or definitely doing something with locking them uh, at the tip to tip. Okay, could you talk to the aerobatic capabilities of the aircraft and what the expected roll rate would be in, in, in comparison to like the uh, Sport Acro? Sure, uh, very similar to the Sport Acro. And, and you know, that, that's not all that surprising when we consider it's an 85% Sonics and when we consider that the, the ailerons are about two-thirds span 
uh, again, uh, not as much of the cord, smaller percentage of the cord, but uh, not at all surprising that it's just about as sprightly in roll as the Sport Acro, and that makes me smile, man. That is awesome. That's what we fly for. Okay, I have a question here from Rob who'd like to know what color you intend to paint the plane. <laughs> Rob Maddox, that's a good question, my friend. Um, We'll see. You know, all the other airplanes, and that's a decision that honestly hasn't been made yet, but uh, uh, the factory color is yellow. Uh, clearly, we have a ton of airplanes that are yellow, and I'm pushing hard to look at some alternatives and expand the line a little bit, but uh, if I lose out and it becomes yellow, well, everybody will know it's coming, and everybody will know it's a Sonics aircraft plane. But uh, we'll see. That's, that's to be determined, Rob, and stay tuned. Okay, Rob would like to, another Rob, not not Rob Maddox, uh, would like to know about uh, how the forward visibility is in the tail dragger version. Now that you've got a little bit of time on it, um, in, in the aircraft when you're taxiing. Sure, sure. Very very common question about visibility. Um, it's excellent. Um, here's what I like about the sloping windshield. It's very common that people would look at that without having sat in it or flown it and say, oh, there's got to be bad visibility. It's, it's one of the best in its class, um, on, on a par with a bubble canopy. Um, as far as the forward visibility on a tail dragger, you just if you get your head almost up against the canopy, which I do, I prop myself up with uh, cushions, and this goes for the 1X as well, you can see uh, at least straight ahead, so you'd be able to see anybody that's uh, over four feet tall. Um, and a, a little bit taller, you'll be able to, uh, to see you know, at least halfway to the ground, so two feet tall. But all you have to do is a very slight S-taxi in these airplanes because of that sloping windshield, and you're able to see right down to the ground. So I highly recommend at least a slight S-taxi in these airplanes, and you've got awesome visibility forward. Uh, Jeremy, if you could pull up the slide on pricing, a couple of people have asked about that. Sure. And, then, and then Ruth would like to know what tools are going to be uh, required for assembly of the aircraft. Uh-huh. Um, let's talk about tools to assemble. The, we have the list uh, on the website of uh, tools required to build. It's exactly the same. Uh, as the tools required to build the Sonics, YX, and Xeno. So you need a good assortment of drill bits, Clecos, and actually, if you go on our website, you can listen to me. If you're not sick of me already, you listen to me detail those tools. I go through uh, two, two separate presentations. Actually, I think, I think it might be even be three, but anyway, it, it, it lists all the, all the tools you need uh, step by step, and, and everywhere you hear Sonics, uh, just substitute 1X, and you can equip your shop right now. Okay, Jeremy, we've uh, pretty much used up our allotted time. I want to thank you for uh, presenting tonight. It was an excellent presentation. We, uh, I believe we set a record on how many people right. tuned in tonight, well over 500 people, which is awesome. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. And uh, any, any last comments? And also, if they still have questions, because I have a lot of them left here, how do they get more information? Sure. Uh, again, going back to that early slide, I'll just hold the, the total cost slide here for a second. Um, my final comment is thank you, home builders. Um, you know, our, our company and our family has, has, really, uh, has really been successful in this industry because of your uh, heartwarming support and uh, everything you do. Um, really admire anybody that, uh, that builds with their own two hands. And uh, it's remarkable the kinds of things that home builders accomplish. And we take great pride in all of your accomplishments, just like you do ours. Um, and, and, and keep them coming. All of your flight stories, all your build stories, uh, we love them. We live for that stuff. Um, as far as getting your questions answered, uh, uh, you're obviously welcome to email anybody, anytime at the Sonics Factory. Uh, the main, the, the guy who bears the brunt of usually the, the emails is, uh, the sales emails is Mark uh, Shabel, and he's reachable at sales, S-A-L-E-S, at sonicsaircraft.com. Uh, or, of course, you're welcome to join any of these. Uh, again, the e-groups, I think, are excellent. You can join the Sonics Talk Group which is kind of our general group for Sonics discussions, but I post almost everything I post to any group to that group just to make sure we cover all the bases. And uh, it's, a, it's just a great way to communicate. Of course, you can use the telephone. 
yes, we have a phone number, 920-231-8297. Uh, we have fax, but that rings about once every third day now. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to use email, phone, or, or any of those uh, uh, e-group uh, listings, and, and we'll take good care of you. That's what we're here for. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. And with that, stay warm and have a great night. Thanks, thank Charlie. You. Thanks to EAA.